the large companies have more than 140 products that have gone through the FDA and on the, on the market. I've also run startup companies to large multi-billion dollar companies. I'm now currently a business consultant in my private practice. I'm also a business consultant for the SPDC at UCI Applied Innovation for Startups. So, uh, now we gotta get the clicker working. Is there a power button here? Be flexible. If you're a startup company, you have to learn how to be flexible. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another. How about the? Yeah, where's the arrow? get started. Yeah, I'll just work it that way. You're going back and forth. So here's a little bit of my my humor. You know, I need a little bit of seed money. I'm gonna go feed the pigeons. So what I'm gonna talk about today is really about what it really takes to win an SBIR grant, should be a SBIR grant. I'm, uh, I'm gonna repeat some of the things you, you heard earlier this morning and even since you heard the last talk, you might hear it again on the fourth talk. I think it'll be good to hear it a couple times because that ultimately might sink in. So these are some of the agencies that actually uh, provide SBIRs and SDTR grants. NSF, NIH, we've already heard about them today. I'm sure Department of Energy and Department of Defense, Department of Agriculture are all speaking, or many of them are speaking today. I'm most familiar with the NIH, so most of my comments are going to be focused around the NIH, but in general, the comments are applicable to the, to the other areas. You'll hear more about this in the fourth talk. These are the elements for the reviewer criteria for the different agencies. The highlights in yellow are really important, but I want you to take the take home. All these areas are critically important. If you actually make an error or are not that great on one of them, it might knock you out of, the, uh, of being awarded. Again, you're going to get all these slides as well. Who here is thinking of putting in an SBIR grant? In, in September. Yeah. If you haven't already started, you're already too late. So before you actually, what I'm gonna talk about, before you actually start writing, there's a lot that you have to do before you start to sit down and write. And you actually heard some of it in the last talk. So the first thing that's important, before you start, and I don't know if you formed your company yet, you need to put a team together. Without a team, first of all, the team is a big part of the, of the proposal, and the team's gonna really help you actually put this whole program together. So who's on your team? Here's an example of many of the experts that you might wanna consider. Perhaps the most important person, and this could be you, is the principal investigator, or the PI. The PI is actually responsible for the project planning and the direction of the project. He or she will be the actual project lead. Ideally, it's not an absolute, ideally you wanna find a PI who's done this before, who's actually successfully been awarded an SBIR grant. It's not an absolute, you don't absolutely have to have them, but the reviewers like to see somebody who actually knows how to manage a project and how to manage money. So it's a big help. If you don't have a, a PI yet, if you've never done this before, I would strongly suggest you try and find one. It's important to know that if you do find a PI, the PI has to be dedicated to this project. They don't necessarily have to be an employee of your company. They can be a contractor, but the guidance for NIH, for SBIRs, SDTRs are a little bit different. Generally, greater than 50% of their time has to be spent on this company. So if they're a professor at UC Riverside, and they're going to, their main job is doing research at UC Riverside and teaching, and they're only going to be 10% of your, of your company, they're not your PI. I also would advise you to get a bunch of other people associated with the grant. 
So if you're in the health, if you're in the science area, and many of the things that for SBIRs are in the science area, try and get a scientific advisory board. People who are experts in the field who can give you advice. You might want to have, you do want to have, as you heard earlier, commercialization people, people that understand sales and marketing, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. You might want strategic partners. For instance, if you have to fabricate something, you might have to have a manufacturing partner. Uh, and if you're going to be in a medically related product, which is in a regulated area, regulatory <laughs> strategy is going to be a big part of your application. And you definitely need to get somebody with regulatory affairs and FDA experience. So this should come as no surprise. SBIR is all around product and commercialization. So before you go for an SBIR grant, you gotta make sure you actually have a product. A product is not a technology. So a lot of people, and I, I see a lot of companies tell me they have this great technology. And they're like, great, what's, what's it good for? What's, what's the product? And, and they really don't have a product idea yet. So that's a little bit too early. You really have to get a product. And it has to be a product with a commercial application. So SBIRs uh, are always around product development. As you heard before, you need to be solving a problem of a customer. And I'll talk about that also in a little bit more detail. And it has to provide value in the eyes of the, of the customer. So as we were talking about the last session, I heard a lot of people tell you, telling us what they perceive the value is to the customer. Unless during your interviews you actually hear that value and it comes out loud and clear, that's why you have to do a lot of interviews. And we, I also typically recommend at least 100 interviews. You don't hear 50, 60, 70% of them saying, I really need to decrease my manufacturing costs. And that's at the top of their mind it might not be a real value in that customer. So those interviews are critically important. So in addition to a team and a product, you actually also have to have a project and that's why the team's important. In order to get your product through feasibility, through development, through manufacturing scale up, in the beta test and in the commercialization, those are all activities which require a lot of coordination. Yes, it requires a lot of cash. And you really have to manage that as if you manage any other project in any other aspect of your life. And the project and the project team is really a big part of the, what I'm gonna talk about today, which is a research approach, but it's also you need a team to actually put this whole package together. So kind of remember what SBIRs and SDTIs are all about. They're about a product development based on some technological innovation with a credible commercialization strategy. You need to define the innovation. And you also should be defining the innovation again in from the customer's eyes from the science. Hopefully you're developing a revolutionary product, something that's gonna change the world, change people's lives dramatically. SBIRs and SCTRs generally do not look that kindly around evolutionary products. So they're not gonna be awarded for a product that has already been developed and they're not gonna be awarded for some slight improvement of an existing technology that only needs capital for commercialization. So it's really something that's gonna move, make a dramatic change in your customers' lives, in science, and in people's lives. So you saw this earlier this morning from Matthew. So again, NIH mission. So if you're gonna apply for an NIH SBIR grant, you have to make sure your product actually adheres to this mission. I mean, you can read it, I'll read it along with you. To seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, reduce illness and disability. 
It's that last sentence or last phrase, enhance health, lengthen life, reduce illness and disability. So as you write, and if you're writing for an NIH grant, please keep those words in mind. You might want to use those here and there on the grant. Okay, so you have the elements together, you have a team, you think you have a product, you have a product, you now are formulating how you're actually gonna work the product through. You're ready to write, correct? Everybody's ready to go? And the answer to that is no, you're actually not ready to go. This is where I think if you, if you haven't started the process yet, for September, you're probably too late. You might have to wait till next January. You actually have to go out and do acquire preliminary data. You have to conduct a lot of research, both literature research and marketing research, which we heard before. You actually have to plan your experimentation. You have to develop at least a commercialization idea or strategy in phase one. It has to be a detailed commercialization plan in phase two. You have to convene the technical team. And by the way, you also have to have facilities. Now you don't have to have facilities. In the NIH area, it's called environment, but it actually means facilities and like equipment, resources. You don't have to have the resources when you're writing the application, but before you get the cash, before you get the award, if you're so awarded, you need to have a place to do the work. And so some people might say, okay, I'll go, I'll figure that out later, I'll send it in, and then you find out you can't get lab space, or you can't get a facility, and all of a sudden, you're not gonna get the cash. So just a couple things in mind. You're gonna see in my presentation, I have a number of rules. These are my five C's of communication. They're, they're pretty clear. Uh, you wanna make, this is what I like to think of. You wanna make sure in your application that it's complete, that you've conveyed all the facts required by the audience. And you heard me say this several times. The people that are going to review your grant application are not necessarily experts in your field. More likely than not, they are not experts. So you need to make sure you convey all the information to them so they can understand your application. That no crucial information is missing, that leaves no questions in the mind of the readers. I've looked at applications where I didn't understand it, and I have to find out, I have to go do various searches to find out what what that person's talking about. You heard, and that's in, in business proposals. You heard that Martin said they get 6,000 to 8,000 applications. I can assure you that the reviewers are not gonna spend that time. If they have to go to Google or go to do a literature search to find out what you're, what you're talking about, that's gonna get a pretty low score and they're gonna probably reject it pretty quickly. It should be concise. So I like the Mark Twain quote, and you might have all heard this. I, I intended to write a short letter, but I didn't have the time. So a lot of people, it's really hard to write concisely with very few words. So that's why I think you, you need to really plan a lot of time. All these applications have very set limits, page limits on the different sections. Some of them, one you'll talk about is only 30 lines of text. So learning how to write concisely is, is, is important. Learning how to be clear using exact language, and especially in the case of sciences, you, you want to be precise in your language. You want to be concrete. And then most importantly, although it seems to get by a lot of people, your language has to be correct. So no punctuation errors. No grammar errors, <coughs> no spelling errors. Spell check, and I can give you a perfect example. I once told somebody I was gonna take a camel to get to do a product, and they couldn't figure out why I was taking a camel. Camel was spelled correctly, just my spell, my computer changed, and I was using channel. I must have typed it wrong and changed it to camel. I didn't catch it. <laughs> it was pretty funny at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then your writing style again keep in mind you're not talking to experts in your field you're, talk, you're talking to knowledgeable people they're intelligent people but they don't know your space so write to your audience don't use emotion 
no exaggeration, no hyperbole. Don't say this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Use proper technical writing. And then watch out for jargon and acronyms and then abbreviations. They might be common in your field of expertise, in your field, <coughs> but somewhere else, another reader has no idea what you're talking about. So spell the words out. I know you have only a few lot, you know, a few pages to write something, so people like to jump to acronyms. I read a, a grant proposal just the other day, it happened to be for UCI, and I had, they were using abbreviations throughout their proposal. I don't know what they're talking about. I had to go online to actually figure out what this thing was about. Again, obviously, I didn't rate that really high because I was getting frustrated because I had to keep going back and forth onto my computer to actually find out what the acronyms were. So you'll hear a lot more detail about this uh, in the fourth presentation. These are the key criteria for an NIH reviewer. So the side on the left are the view criteria. The ones on the right are what that actually means. So the first thing you're gonna need is a title for your project. You need a team. You need to know what problem you're trying to solve. You actually have to state the problem in the form of a hypothesis that can be tested. You need to develop project aims or objectives. You want to demonstrate the significance of the project, so the impact that your project will have on the NIH mission or whatever agency's mission you're going to apply to. Your experimental approach and expected results. And here's a really big one that a lot of first time grant applications forget. They have this beautiful approach. Say, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna get these results, and I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna get those results. Not realizing that your first approach, more likely than not, will fail. So they actually wanna say, in case that fails, what are you gonna do? I, I actually, for this talk, I went out and talked. I did some of my own market research by talking to people that have failed at getting SBIR grants and those that have been successful SBIR grants. So that's one thing that two of them told me. We forgot to put our alternative approach in our first proposals that got rejected. And then lastly, do you have the facilities to do the work? So a research title. In many cases, reviewers read one of two things first. The titles or the aims. So the title can again make or break, and I'm, you might be the same way, the title can make or break whether they're gonna be excited about your, your project. So you give that careful thought. I typically write my titles last. I do all the work, I get the whole proposal together, and then I have a better idea of how to write a title. So it needs to be concise and clear. It needs to describe what your research is about. Here's our, again, one of my general rules for titles. And about, by the way, all these granting agencies will give you guidance on how many words or how many characters your title have to be. So typically between five and 15 words. It should include words that describe the significance the innovation, the impact on health in the case of NIH, and those other words, based on the literature. And just like other things of which I'm gonna suggest you do is don't write one title. Write 10 titles, write 15 titles. And go to your friends, go to your colleagues, go to your peers, go to your spouses, significant others, whatever, and test market the titles. Find out what resonance resonates with the audience. Especially if you can go to some key opinion leaders and experts in the area. See, does this actually make sense? And again, I think it's a great, great way to do it. It's actually pretty quick. And you can get a pretty good idea as to what looks to be like a great title or not. <coughs> Next thing you have to do is try and identify the problem. As I was listening to a lot of you this morning, a lot of you are in the first presentation, you have, a, you have an ID, you have a product, and you actually think you know what the problem is. And I'm gonna say right now is you probably don't know what the problem is. 
And again, I have nothing, again, I'm a scientist. I did this a long time. I came up with this great idea because I was having pain in my laboratory, develop a product, go all the way through, go to the market, find out, yeah, not bad, not if you want to buy it. I changed that a long time ago. I got some good guidance from uh, some of the companies I worked for and through practical experience, you know, but I have to, have to do a lot of research up front to do it. So I was two words that I would suggest you think about. First thing is read, second thing is listen. So before you actually start out to write the application, you need to do an exhaustive literature research. <coughs> I mean exhaustive, I'll give you some ideas on how to do that in a second. Read as much as you can, read the current literature, that's the last couple of years. Again, depending on your field, my field is molecular biology, molecular diagnostics, to me, I have to look at literature the last two or three years. If I go back more than two or three years ago, it's irrelevant. If I go back to when I got my PhD, back then it was one gene, one protein. That's not even true anymore. And things like microRNA and uh, exosomes and all, I can name a whole bunch of things that we didn't even know they existed back then. So, again, in my field, I have to look at literature going back maybe no more than two or three years. Some of the other fields, you might be able to go back a little bit longer than that. I also suggest you read the lay press. Read the patent literature. Patent literature is an amazing place to go. I mean, it's boring as heck to read patents, at least in my opinion. But it's a great place to go see uh, uh, what's been uh, developed before. If you're in healthcare, you need to interview healthcare professionals. So I'll take the case of, uh, I knew somebody that was developing a point of care product for infectious disease, and they hadn't gone out and talked to anybody. So I had advised them that they need to go out and talk to healthcare professionals. I said, well, and again, who's your customer? And I'll, I don't want to go into too much detail. Actually, your customer is really varied. It could be in a point of care test, and it could be your doctor, doctor's office. It also could be the emergency room. It could be the ICU. It could be Rite Aid or Walgreens or CVS, because those are all places that you might be point of care. Those are all different customers. So interviewing them and trying to understand their pain points and their needs are critically important. So you really want to learn the pain points for the current standard of care or in other disciplines, whatever the current standard of practices are. And then you want to, again, as you heard today, you want to see if your technology or your product specifically addresses those pain points. So you really want to understand, does your solution dramatically change your customers' lives? And I use those words. It's got to be, for these, it's got to be big, not some, okay, I can, I used to be able to do this test in an hour, and now your technology lets me do it in 55 minutes. That's not a really big change. But if you had something to test that took two days to do, and your technology can get a result back to the patient in five minutes, you know, that can make the right therapy two days earlier, that, that could be something that's pretty dramatic. I mean, just to a sidebar, we talked about how, you, how do you validate whether you have identified a need and your, your product actually meets those needs. I'd actually suggest you go back and talk to customers. You can try and sit around a table, so I'll differ a little bit from the last one, and say, okay, I looked up all these 100 interviews, my, tech, my product solves those needs, so I'm done. And I would say, eh, maybe not. Go talk to another 10 or 15 customers, again, have it, have it described in detail. So go te test that hypothesis again. And ideally, in your application, if you can get a customer saying and writing a letter, hey, your pro uh, this is a really big pain for, for me, and your product, if successful, will solve that pain point, that can go a long way in an SBRI grant. And for some of these grants, you can actually submit those letters. So 
now we'll get to the writing. You also have to have your innovation identified. And innovation, you would, so again, is your solution innovative? <coughs> Does it move our understanding of science? These are some of the questions you can ask. Does it have dramatic value to your customers? So again, before you start writing your grant on your nifty idea or your nifty product, talk to potential customers, identify their pain point, and make sure your product satisfies and resolves those issues. So, importance of a literature search. Again, you're gonna get this, read the literature. I put together a number of uh, search engines that I use to look the literature. And so you'll have this later. Hopefully it'll be, the hyperlinks will be there. And you can go click on them. They're, they're all good. I use them all. I use PubMed a lot. Uh, and just because it's been around for a long time and I'm an old guy and I'm just used to what I'm used to. But some of the other ones are quite good as well. Look the current trends. Seek input from the experts. Identify the pain points, and by doing that, you'll have a pretty good idea of where the knowledge gaps are and where the big controversial areas are in your area. You're doing all this to identify the problem. So this is the part of the, the NIH proposal. What problem are you trying to solve? You really need to understand, identify what the problem is. Again, many of you have product ideas already. You think you know what the problem is. You have to be careful. You don't trick your mind that I already know what it is. I'm just going to go through the motion of doing all this work, but I'm going to come back to the problem that I have. All this literature research, all these customers' interviews will help you clearly identify the top pain points for these customers. And again, I've seen many, many times where somebody's going to come to me and they say, yeah, Customers, this is a pain point for the customer. When I look at the research, I look at the literature, it's number 15 in the list of pain points for the customer. It's not number one, two, or three. And if it's not one, two, or three, it's unlikely that they're gonna be buying your product. So some people are confused between a question and a hypothesis, and again, does everybody know the difference between the two? Asking a question and asking a hypothesis, because on the NIH grants, they're actually proposing a hypothesis. They're actually two sides of the same coin. A research question is just that, it's written as a question. It proposes a relationship between a couple of variables. So, I'll give you one. What's the effect of heat on the effectiveness of bleach? That's a question. Hypothesis is by turning that around into a statement. A statement, which is an educated guess or prediction of an outcome. In order to test that hypothesis, you have to have to do experimentation and get quantifiable or qualitative data to answer, to uh, prove or disprove that hypothesis. So in, this, in the case of the bleach, Bleach removes blood stains from cotton shirts more effectively when the wash temperature is between 30 and 40 degrees C. You can actually understand how you can actually now clearly test that hypothesis. So you're gonna actually create a hypothesis in your proposal. So here's some other examples. Between questions and hypotheses, so I'll just read one. Does taking aspirin every day reduce the chance of having a heart attack? Good question, unfortunately it's a yes or no answer. Uh, not, not all that exciting. Maybe more exciting is taking it, aspirin daily does not affect heart attack risk. And that's something that's probably more interesting to test. So, do you always form a hypothesis in a, in a not way, or could you, can your hypothesis be taking aspirin does attack? So I, there are, is that, it has to do with the chi-square? Chi well, you can do a null hypothesis. So the not is a null hypothesis. There's about four different ways you can write hypotheses. I had it in here. I was advised, because I'm a PhD, to take it out, because you're not all 
That's your academic. So you can form it the other way too. You can form it the other way okay. too. There's lots of ways of writing it. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, in, in my, my philosophy in good science, you should write a hypothesis and you should do everything possible to, to prove that you're wrong. That's how you do good science. Prove that your hypothesis is wrong, as opposed to only do experiments that actually validate your hypothesis. Again, as you start to write your proposal, the reviewers will be looking at this. If you're just doing simple experiments that actually just reprint to reinforce your hypothesis, it really doesn't stress your hypothesis. It's more, more likely than not you'll get rejected. So now that you have a hypothesis, now comes the hard work. You have to actually develop the objectives of your, of your research application. Aims are directly tied to your hypothesis. The objectives are what you expect to show at the end of your research. And there's a difference between phase one and phase two. Phase one is pretty early. So you're not gonna, I'll show you, you're not gonna have a lot of objectives in phase one. Phase two, you might have a lot more. In the case of NIH, the aims are perhaps the most important part of the, of the application. So it says it's very important, it's probably the most important. It establishes the objectives, establishes the value, and it actually answers what questions you're asking. So again, you're testing your hypothesis, but behind your hypothesis are some basic questions. So another one of my rules, it's not my rules, it's a lot of people's rules. So you've all heard of SMART, SMART objectives. Those that have worked in corporations, you write performance of goals or always SMART goals. So nothing really all that fancy, but just keep it in mind. They're specific, which means they're tied to the hypothesis. They're measurable, they're quantifiable. So it can be quantifiable endpoints, it could be a dollar endpoint, it could be a time improve, it could be an improvement. I'm gonna improve the quality from 1,000 defects of one in 1,000 parts per uh, defects, one in defect in a 1,000 in a to one in 100,000, something to that effect. It has to be attainable. So again, phase one is a six to 12 month uh, duration of your research. Don't put a goal in, it's going to take you three years or four years <coughs> to do. It's got to be something that you can really achieve in six to eight months. It's got to be realistic. So again, within the time frame and the available resources, and it has to be timely. So once you set objectives, they don't change. If I say I'm going to get this objective done in six months, as you're starting to do the work, and it, and it takes you nine months, you actually kind of fail the objective. And objectives have to have two parts to it. They have to have the aim and a measurable outcome. A lot of people actually miss this part. You actually have to have some quantitative measurement which tells you it's a binary thing. You either achieve the outcome or you didn't achieve the outcome. So you have to be careful how you write these. So I know and a lot of people say, well, I got I got four of the five things that I wanted to get done. So I mostly achieved it. And the answer is no, you actually didn't. You had five measures to achieve that objective. When you got four of the five, you failed. So you know, I personally wouldn't put four or five, five measures for one objective, but just keep that in mind. So many reviewers actually start with this page. Reading your aims should actually summarize the project in just a few words in the eyes of the reviewer. The aim should excite the reviewer. A lot of them start at this page that should get them all excited so they can actually read the rest of your application. So again, a lot of people go to the title or they go here. And I, we'll get the questions at the end. And don't confuse activities, tasks, with aims. 
the task, which I'm going to get to the next stage, the research approach, all the stuff you're going to have, try and do to achieve the objectives are not the objectives. So aims are they're specific. As I said before, you achieve them or you don't. Tasks do not actually yield reason. They task get you to where you want. Aims have measurable and desired endpoints. And I'm repeating myself, so I won't do that anymore. You want to give your aim an active title that clearly states the objective, so here's how you actually have to do it. Within two to four sentences each, describe the experimental approach that's within the aim. The aim should be related, but not dependent on each other. And we've seen this before. So I have objective one, and objective two is dependent on success of objective one, which means if I failed in objective one, I'm all done. I can't go any further. So you have to be careful about how you read that. And aims again must specify how you will measure the success of the objective. And perhaps obvious here, these are some don'ts. And you can read this. Don't use vague or broad terms. Don't repeat your aims just by using different terms. And if you can't measure the objective, if you can't measure the result, it's not an objective. Now we get to the heart of the proposal, which is the study, the study approach. So you have a team, you have a PI, you have a project, you have a title, you completed your research and framed the question, you turn your question into a hypothesis, you identify two major objectives, which by the way, in a phase of one grant, one objective or two objectives, no more than that. Remember, you only have six months, you only have a year. Phase two grant might have four or five objectives, typically up to three years. You need to specify the work you will perform to test the hypothesis and answer the question. This is the largest part of the application. I think in a phase one, it's a six page limit. In a phase two, it's a 12 page <coughs> So here's your writing the most. And all the other things that I talked about, they're typically a one page limit, sometimes a two page limit. Your approach now, when you get to here, you're trying to close the deal. This is your sales pitch. This is where you do a lot of writing. This is where you're going to show the significance. <coughs> the significance to the science, the significance to the customer. It shows how you're going to solve the customer problem. It shows how your product addresses an unmet need in the market. It shows that the value of the customer. And again, you've already done your literature search. You know what all the, the current standards of care are. You know what the current competition is. You're going to use this section to actually separate yourself from that. A big part of NIH and some of these other agencies are showing significance. So what do you mean by that? It's got to be a significant product, a significant innovation, something really breakthrough. You're moving science forward. You're answering some big unknown questions. There's a significant need in the market. This is a big problem. And there's a significant commercial opportunity. You have to have at least one of these. It'd be great if you had all four. You also have to describe the innovation. Describe it. Why is it innovative? How does it move the field forward? And once this is out in the marketplace, what does this innovate? How can this innovation lead to other innovations? How does it advance the state of the art? This is my uh, another sick attempt of, of humor. Uh, if you're starting out and you don't have any preliminary data to put into your research approach, you're not ready, in my opinion, to send in an application. You need to have some data. Even though a phase one is typically a feasibility phase, it's not, I just have an idea. If I just have an idea, maybe that's an NFF, NSF application. But for NIH, they really want you to have, okay, as a reviewer say, there's risk here, but it's, it's, it's likely feasible. 
So the top thing shows you how people like to think about grants. I write a grant, I get money, I do my work, I publish the results or I get to the end in the case of SBIR grant, and I do it again and I get more money. And unfortunately that's not the way it works. Now it's perhaps not as bad like this, as in, this is more about a, a basic research grant, but you actually have to have some data in your application to demonstrate that your idea, your product has at least a chance at feasibility. So we, can you, instead of publication, can you put if your patents? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, again, I stole this from a basic research thing, but yeah, it's, 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 I took some poetic uh, license here. Instead of publishing the results is, you're, you're reporting back to NIH about your success, and that'll lead you to get in phase two. So here it is right here, you actually have a little bit of data, you have a pretty good idea it's gonna work, you're gonna do a couple more experiments to nail it down. But again, I'm just saying if you don't have any data, I've read these things, it's like, well, can they really do this? It sounds like a great idea, but is it actually even feasible? Mm -hmm. So having a little bit of data indicates that, yeah, there's, it's, it's probably gonna work. So the research approach needs to clearly support your goals. The writing has to be complete and really show you have mastery of the subject matter. By the way, you're going to have to cite references as you as you do. So if you're if you're cite if you're citing some of your scientific literature, your marketing work, at least capture that where you where, where you actually collected that data. And remember, the reviewers may not have expertise in your area. Don't make them look anything up. Provide enough detail so they can make an informed review. So we're getting six pages here again. Watch the jargon. Watch the acronyms. Watch that you go so deep in an area that you, you really haven't deeply explained it. This technical area, this scientific area. Um, you don't want to have to do this. Here are the elements in a research approach. Again, you need a specific aim and it, you need a separate section for each aim. You have to demonstrate a rationale for that aim. Why is this objective important? You have to show your experimental design and methods. So now you're getting into the science, and if you're not a scientist, if you're not a scientist, if you have a scientist on your team, and again, there's nothing, you don't have to be a scientist to do the, for, for these applications. You could be a marketing person. You wanna bring the right, that's where your PI comes with. The study population, the characteristics, whatever you might be doing, criteria, the actual experiments that you're gonna perform, the study procedures and the methods. How will you analyze and interpret the data? Discuss the potential pitfalls. What can go wrong? If something goes wrong, what's your alternative approach? And again, some of the people I talked to, they failed because they didn't do that the first time, the second time they got it. What are your milestones? What statistical analyses are you going to do? And in this area, you also have to put money, how much money you need for these objectives. I'm not going to go into this in this talk. So some questions you should be asking yourself. Do the experiments relate to the aims? Are the experiments logical and well integrated? Are the endpoints and milestones clearly defined? Is the appropriate statistical analysis included? Here, who here is a statistician? Okay, so if you're not, go find the statistician. Make sure they are looking at the experiments that you've written. Make sure it actually makes sense. Is there a sensible timeline? So one of the things that I think would be really helpful, simple Gantt chart, answer these questions. What tasks are gonna be done? Who's going to do it? When are they going to do it? And where are they going to do it? And you can actually show this in your proposal in the grant. So that actually shows you have a pretty good command. You actually have milestones set. You have a well thought out plan. And you've given the reviewers uh, the confidence that you actually know what you're going to do. 
The NIH actually requires an abstract. Uh, this is actually a really important piece too. So again, every every is important. Aims, title, or perhaps the most important. This is something where you have you might want to write first. You only get thirty lines of text. You have to write this in lay terms. The abstracts are actually published in the public record. So if you have anything confidential or anything proprietary, you don't want to put it in the abstract. So in summary, am I out of time? Yeah. In summary, perfect timing. Sorry, summary, know the rules. Every section is important. If you mess up on one, no goal. <coughs> There's an accountability in the NIH for rigor and reproducibility. I've included some references in here. You can go read those excellent government documents later to understand about rigor and reproducibility. Make sure you really read the rules, the solicitation, request for proposals, or the FOAs. They all have guidance on font sizes, on actually font types, on section headings, the maximum number of characters in the project title, the page numbers and where you actually put the page numbers, the line spacing, the margins, the page limitations, and the sequence. If you fail any one of those, you probably won't even get into the reduced time. And lastly, when you're done read, writing it, read it, read it again, Read it a third time. Give it to your friends, colleagues, and that's it. Read it again. And uh, again, misspelled word may make all the difference between a rejection letter and writing a uh, winning proposal. And lastly, these are the elements of writing an award winning grant. You actually can answer these six questions What important problem is being addressed? What do you intend to do? Do you have the team, resources, and expertise to do it? What's already been done? Is the work feasible yet novel? Grants that are well-focused and are understandable by the reviewer not skilled in your area of expertise have an excellent chance of being awarded. <coughs> and lastly, these are some references that I use for this presentation and some other references to help you in writing a successful grant. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And these slides will be made available. And I'm not sure how we're going to get the video, but uh, uh, for those who want to do it again, I'm sorry we don't have time for questions and answers, but would you no. be able to answer questions in the, sure, I'll step out. the beautiful outdoor uh, yes. lobby?